All right, this is uh, lesson 11.2. We're going to be talking about measures of spread today. Uh, I'm not making a video for 11.1. It's primarily just vocabulary, and so you can read it just as well as I can read it to you. So to, uh, last time I had you look at measures of central tendency, like the mean, the median, and the mode. The mean, the median, and the mode are all telling you um, approximately where the center of the data is. Now, there are different types of center. Um, the mean is calculated by uh, adding the values up and dividing by the number of values. So it's an average. Uh, the median is telling you where the middle of the data is. And the mode is, of course, telling you the value of data that comes up the most often. But they are all types of center. Uh, so for every set of data, you'll have some sort of center that you're interested in, and that tells you one aspect of the data or, you know, one of the characteristics of the data. There's another characteristic that a set of data has that's called its variation or sometimes it's spread. The measure of variation tells you how spread out your data is. Um, two data sets might have exactly the same center. You can see uh, in this box it has two data sets. They both have a median of 70, but that upper data set is way more spread out than the lower data set. Uh, and then again, I have these box plots over here that are showing you uh, three data sets that all have a median of about 4.6. So they all have a center of 4.6, um, but their range is much, much different. Uh, in other words, they are spread out differently. So for every set of data, you should report both a measure of center and a measure of variation. And those two numbers together give you a lot of information about that set of data. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing on measures of spread or measures of variation. Before we can talk a whole lot about measures of spread, we have to talk about quartiles. So you know that if you have a set of data, like this small little set of data I have up here, it has a minimum, it has a maximum, and we can find the median or the middle of the data if those data uh, are in order. Um, the median is essentially dividing the data set into two halves. If we take each half of the data and further divide it in half so that we uh, divide our data set into four parts, the measures, uh, or the, sorry, the values separating those four parts are called quartiles. So we have on this lower side, we have Q1, quartile 1. Um, that's the halfway point in that first half of the data. And over here, we have quartile 3, or the upper quartile, which is the halfway point on that upper half. Uh, they're called quartiles because they're dividing the data set into quarters, into fourths. So we now have these four parts. Uh, when you're finding the quartiles, you don't use the median. So you can see I looked at the five values below the median and the five values above the median. All right, so uh, the first measure of spread is the range. You've already been working on finding ranges. Um, for this particular data set, we're going to keep working with this data set. The range would be the highest value or the maximum, whoa, minus the lowest value, which is the minimum. So 34 subtract 12. So our range is 22. Well, we just learned that we could divide it into quartiles. We have another type of range. It's called the interquartile range. The interquartile range is the range between the quartiles. Uh, usually you calculate it by subtracting Q1 from Q3. So in this case, if we do uh, Q3 and we subtract Q1, we get an interquartile range of 15. So they're both types of range. One of them is the range of all the data. The other one is the range of the middle 50% of the data. 
All right, so now you should know from our last lesson and this lesson, you should know how to find the mean, the median, the mode, the range, and the IQR. There's another measure of spread we're going to talk about in a minute called the standard deviation, but we haven't learned that one yet. So we want to find all of the above statistics for this set of data. It is the number of students at each of our local high schools. So we have our high school, Desert Hills, first there, Dixie High School, Hurricane High School, Pineview High School, Snow Canyon High School, and Mill Creek High School. Uh, well, the first measure of center we want to find is the mean. So you can calculate that by adding up all of these values and dividing by, there are six of them. So if you do that, you will get, it would probably be good for you to practice this while I am typing it in as well. Uh, we get a mean of 944.2. So that was all the values added. And then divide by uh, the number of values in this case, 6. All right, the next one is the median. Well, to find the median, you need to think about those uh, values in order. So we'll start with the lowest, then we have 832, 1127, 1144. Oh, I missed the 1048. Here we go, and the 1293. So the median, we can find by finding that middle point, the center. Uh, and that would fall here. There's three below it, three above it. Uh, remember, if there is not an odd number of values in your data set, you would uh, average or find the mean of the two closest to the center. So we'll add the 1048 to the 1127 and divide that by two to get a median value of 1087.5. So I found that by adding those two closest values and then dividing by two. Um, make sure in your calculator that you either group this and then divide by two or separate it into two steps on your calculator. I'm gonna write that median down here. All right, for the mode, we would just see if there was a particular value in our data set that came up a lot, very often. And in this case, there's no mode. All of our values are different. All right, the range of the value. Remember to find the range. You think about that highest value and that lowest value, and you subtract them. It's 1293. Subtract 221. And we get a range of... 1,072, so we've got a really big range here. Uh, the interquartile range, our last one here, well, to find the interquartile range, we have to find the quartiles. So we can look at each half of the data set. Now, remember, we don't use the median for this, but in this case, the median is not one of the data values, so we'll look at uh, we'll be actually including all of the data as we look for the quartiles. So we look for the middle of this set. Here it is. That's Q1. We look for the middle of this set. Here it is. That's Q3. So for the interquartile range, we do Q3, subtract Q1. In this case, that's 1144, subtract 832. And our interquartile range is, whoops. 1144 minus 832, uh, 312. So that is a quick summary of all of the types of statistics we've calculated so far. We are now going to learn about standard deviation, which is our last measure of spread that we will learn this year. So uh, standard deviation, ooh, it's quite a process to find this. In our quest to find the standard deviation, we are going to start by finding the mean of the data set. Most of the time, you want to find that mean anyway, so it's just going to be um, the first little bit of information that you need. Next, you are going to find the difference between each value of data, or each x, and the mean. 
at this symbol, if you see it, an X with a bar above it is the mathematical symbol for mean. So we're going to find the difference between each value and the mean. Our next step will be that we will square each of those individual differences. And we're going to average those squares. So we've got this fancy formula uh, which helps us find something called the variance. Now the variance has this symbol, which is the sigma, lowercase sigma, it's a Greek letter, to the second power. That is the variance. Uh, okay, we've got this symbol here you may or may not be familiar with. It is called a summation symbol. It's a capital Greek letter sigma. Uh, the summation symbol literally just means add them all up. So for each of our uh, things that we just calculated, these differences squared. So we go through, we calculate all of these differences squared. The summation symbol here tells me add them up and then we divide by the number of data. So it's telling you to find the average. Add them up and divide by the number of data. Uh, and then finally, the very, 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 very last thing is to find the standard deviation. And this is the symbol for standard deviation, uh, lowercase sigma. Usually I draw it by drawing my straight line over and then curving around. You'll see it, you know, all kinds of ways, but usually that's how people draw it. Uh, so the standard deviation, the sigma symbol is used for it. It's equal to the square root of the thing you just did. So that last step, the only thing new there is that you take the square root. So hopefully you understand how to calculate standard deviation. <laughs> Super fun, right? Uh, it's, it is challenging to keep track of all of the information here. Uh, so I think the best way to do it is to use a table. So this table will walk us through this process. I have a column here for the data. The next column is where I will write down the mean. Then I'll find each of those differences by subtracting. And then finally, uh, we'll square those differences. So once we've gone through that process, we'll calculate the variance, which is basically the mean of the last column. We'll add up all of those things and divide by n. And then our very, 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 very last step will be that square root, and that will give us the standard deviation. So quite the process, right? So our data set, I'm going to keep it small this first time. We only have six data values in our set. Uh, it's a, we want to find the mean and standard deviation for the number of Skittles in a package. So I opened up six packages of Skittles and counted how many were in the package, and this is uh, the information that I collected. So the first thing we need to do is find the mean. So we need to add up those six numbers and divide by six. Make sure that you uh, either group it when you're adding it or do it in two separate steps on your calculator so that it, it will uh, do your order of operations right. And you should find, if you calculate it, that the mean of this data set is 55.7 uh, if we round to the nearest tenth. 55.7. So I'm going to put that right here. Our next step is that we're going to find the difference between each of those bags of Skittles and our mean. So for that first call, or first row, I mean, we have a package that had 54 Skittles. But if I subtract the, the mean from that, I find that this bag of Skittles had 1.7 Skittles less than the mean. So it's a negative number here. It's a little bit below the mean. Now, I like to calculate these two columns all at once just for ease. So on my calculator screen right now, I already have this negative 1.7. And then I just tell my calculator, hey, square that value. And I can immediately fill in this next column. Now, this last column should all be positive because when I square a negative number, it should give me a positive result. Okay, so for that next row, it had 53 Skittles. If we subtract the 55.7 from that value, we get negative 2.7. It had 2.7 Skittles less than the mean. And if we square that negative 2.7, we get 7.29.
the next row had 56 Skittles. So if we subtract the mean from that row, we get 0 0.3, 0 0.3 more than the mean. And if we square that value, we get 0 0.09. And you just keep filling in the table on your quest to figure out what the standard deviation is. These last couple have had more than the mean. This one has 2.3 more than the mean. Okay, so we've got our whole chart filled in. Now we're ready to calculate the variance. The variance is the sum of all of those things we just calculated. Let's see, and then we'll divide by, in this case, we're dividing by six. So I'm gonna add this whole column up, find the mean of this column. That's called the variance. And if you're calculating that, I think we find that the variance is, um, let's see, don't forget to divide by six by the number, we get a variance of 4.89. Now our last step, because we, we really don't care super much about the variance. We're just doing it step by step. And then our last step is taking the square root of that number. We just found 4.89. And we find that the standard deviation for this set is 2.2. Okay, so remember, standard deviation is a measure of spread, how spread out your data is. Uh, Essentially, it's telling you, uh, on average, how far away from the mean is any particular bag of Skittles. So our mean here was 55.7, and the average sort of distance away from that mean is about 2.2. Okay, so in class, we also practice this with the measures of the lengths of Beethoven's symphonies. I'm going to skip that for the video. It would be a good practice for you if you want to do it. So, this process of finding standard deviation is uh, a bit tedious. We did it with a very small data set, but what if you had a really big set of data? Or what if you made a small error somewhere in your calculations and you end up with a standard deviation that's really incorrect. There's lots of room for error, and there uh, is, it's very time consuming if you have a large set of data. So uh, it turns out that the best way to calculate standard deviation is to use your calculator or some other tool, a computer or something. Um, it's really impractical to be calculating standard deviations by hand, uh, especially with a large set of data. So, if you want your calculator to calculate a standard deviation for you, uh, the first thing you have to do is put your data into the calculator. Obviously, the calculator cannot calculate the standard deviation if it doesn't even know the data. So, to put the data into your calculator, uh, these instructions are for the TI-84, and I'll show you on the TI-84 in a second. Um, other calculators can do this just as well, so if you have a different calculator, you can ask me and I'll show you in class. But uh, you would hit the stat button, and you hit the edit, or select edit, and then you can put your data into the list. This stat edit process will essentially bring you to a spreadsheet. And then to analyze the data, to get it to calculate the standard deviation and, and some other statistics, uh, you'll hit that stat button again. You go to the right to the choice that says calculate, uh, and then we will calculate the one variable statistics for that list. Um, this will bring up a lot of information for us. It will actually calculate the mean for you. It will calculate the standard deviation. It will list for you the min. 
it'll list the Q1, it'll list the median, it will list the Q3, and it will list the max. It will list all of those things for you. So it's really very powerful and can save you a lot of time. Uh, make sure that you are paying attention to which list you're in. And sometimes once you hit this one variable statistics key, uh, depending on which operating system you have, you may have to hit enter a few times. And then to, so let's go through a set of data and you'll see how these work. Uh, this table is displaying the number of hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean from 1992 to 2006. So this table is saying the first year there were four, the second year there were four, the third year there were three. So that top row is not actually the data. It's just telling you in which year it occurred. And the bottom row is the number of hurricanes. That is the data we're going to use. So uh, if you have a graphing calculator with you, uh, I would do this as I do it. If you don't um, practice in class, using the calculator so that you will know how to use that process. Okay, so let's see, I need to bring up. Oops. Here's the calculator. So when you oh, turn it on, it should go to this default screen. Uh, we're gonna hit stat, we'll bring up this screen and we want to edit the data that's in the calculator. So we hit enter brings us to this spreadsheet. Now mine already has some data in list one, so I'm gonna go over to list one to clear out some data that is in the list. You go up to that list name and don't hit delete. If you hit delete, it's just going to completely wipe out list one, uh, including the title list one. You want to clear the data from list one, so you hit clear and then enter, and it should clear out all that data. All right, so you've got this uh, list available to put your data in. We're going to put in the number of hurricanes. We had four, enter, four, enter. And you just hit enter between each of the data. And it, should, uh, it shouldn't take you very long to put the data in. And you get really fast at it after a while as well with some practice. And I try to kind of keep an eye on my list as I'm typing it in to make sure I'm not uh, making an error. And the other thing that I like to make sure is uh, you can see here, uh, it tells you which number that data value represents. This is my 15th entry in the list. So I like to kind of check that, and I had data for 15 years, and I do have all 15 years represented there. That can help you if you ac or help you catch if you maybe accidentally put in an extra number or put in a duplicate, or if you missed one as you're typing in your list. So I always like to check that. All right, so now if I wanted to calculate my standard deviation, I hit stat, and this time instead of editing my list, I'm going to go over to calculate and it brings up a menu of things that it can calculate. We just want that first choice, one variable stats. We hit enter and now depending on your operating system, you might see something slightly different here. Uh, it's going to calculate it on this operating system for list one automatically. I could change it to a different list, but this is gonna do list one. You may have to hit enter two or three times at this point. When you hit enter, it brings up this screen. That top value, the X with the bar above it, is your mean, 7.3 in this case. Uh, I typically don't use these sums. It's telling you the sum of each data value there. Um, so this, would, this second row would be telling us that there were 109 total hurricanes during those 15 years. So that may come in handy for some purposes, but uh, I don't need it right now. Uh, and right here, you can see this little symbol here is sigma. So it's saying sigma for x. So that don't let the x throw you off. Standard deviation of the x values is 3.21. And we're going to use this row for standard deviation. 
Uh, the N down here at the bottom is referring to the number of data you put in. We put in 15 data values. And you see that little arrow next to the N? It's telling you that there's more information if you scroll down. So if I scroll down a little bit, you can see I'm now shown the minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the max. So it gives you all sorts of information if you just put that list of data into your calculator. So we had a mean in this case of 7.27 and a standard deviation of 3.21. All right, so we're almost done for the day. I wanted to talk about sort of uh, how we can visualize the standard deviation. So in a data list, every value falls within a certain number of standard deviations of the mean. So we're going to go back to our Skittles example for just a minute. Uh, here's a little number line, and the mean number of Skittles was 55.7. It's right there in that blue dashed line on my number line. Well, the standard deviation we calculated to be 2.2. So I'm going to sort of add another number line here, or I'm going to sort of rescale this number line in terms of the standard deviation. Well, the mean plus one standard deviation would be 55.7 plus 2.2, and that's 57.9. That, that's right here. That was 55.7 plus 2.2. Well, if I added another standard deviation or another 2.2, it takes me to the value 60.1. So that was 55.7 plus the two groups of 2.2 and we got 60.1. And we could go on to the other side of the mean as well. If I subtract the 2.2, 55.7 subtract 2.2 is 53.5. And if I subtract another standard deviation, that puts me at the value 51.3. So that was the 55.7 subtract two groups of 2.2. Well, let's plot each of our packages of Skittles onto this number line. We had one package that had 54 Skittles and one package that had 53. We had one package that had 56 and one package that had 59. We had one package that had 58 Skittles and we had a package that had 54 Skittles again. So these dashed lines are are showing me how each of those data values relates to the mean and the standard deviation. So my first question here in red says, how many data are within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, my mean is here, 55.7. Oh, I'm like moving it around. Uh, if I go out one standard deviation in each direction, I have three data within that region three data values, the two packages that had 54 and the one package that had 56. Uh, the next question says, what percentage of the data are within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, there were three of the packages out of a total of six, that is 50%. So 50% or half of our data is within one standard deviation of the mean. The last question here says, all of the data fall between blank standard deviations of the mean. So I, I, I wish I could show you my hands so they could show you how I think about this, but starting at the center, if we go out one standard deviation on each side, we encompass three of the values. If we go out one, two in each direction, then we've encompassed all of the data. So all of the data fall within two standard deviations of the mean. Now you wouldn't say four here. Um, we're talking about going out 
uh, symmetrically from the center. So we go out one standard deviation would get us this whole group, two standard deviations in this case gets us all of the information, all of the data. All right, so we're going to do that again with Beethoven symphonies. Now, I skipped finding the mean and standard deviation in the video, but I have them listed here. The mean was 36.8, and the standard deviation was 12.1. So uh, on our number line, we're going to count, let's see, our minimum was 22, and we need to get up to 65. So I'm going to start with 20 and count by fives. And I'm going to show where the mean is. The mean was 36.8. So that's about right here. That's our mean X bar. And you can write the number with that as well if you want. So from that mean value, we need to uh, count out by standard deviations. So 12.1 is our standard deviation. So I'm going to first go in the positive direction. I'm going to add 12.1. That takes me to uh, 48.9. So this was the mean plus one standard deviation. And if I add another 12.1, that takes me to the value 61. That was the mean plus two standard deviations. And I'm going to add one more because it looks like it'll fit. 73.1 would be the mean plus three standard deviations. And now I just need to measure out in the other direction, 36.8. Subtract the standard deviation, 12.1. Takes me to 24.7. That's the mean minus the standard deviation. Oops. 24.7 and subtract another standard deviation takes me to uh, 12.6 minus two standard deviations. Okay, so we've got our rescaled number line there by measured by standard deviations. Let's plot our data. First symphony was 27 minutes. Then we had one that was 30 minutes, a 47-minute symphony, a 35-minute symphony, a 30-minute symphony, a 40-minute symphony, 35, 22, and the last one was 65. So here's where our data values fall. So the first question says, what percentage of the data are within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, there are within one standard deviation. So from the mean, if we go out one standard deviation, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven values out of a total of nine. And if we calculate the percentage that represents seven out of nine, it would be about 78% of the data. I just rounded to the nearest whole number there. Next question says, what percent of the data are within two standard deviations of the mean? So from the mean right here, we're going to go out one, two standard deviations. So we get to add in this other value. We have now encompassed eight out of the nine data. That would be 89%. And then the last question says, all of the data fall between how many or within how many standard deviations? Well, it looks like I need to go out a third standard deviation. So over here, that would take me pretty low, but I've got to go out three standard deviations to get that last value. All right. One last little concept uh, is the concept of outliers for today. Uh, an outlier is a value that is substantially different from the rest of the data in a set. Uh, they can cause statistics to be misleading because they affect the measures of the center and they uh, affect the measures of variation. Uh, so there are fancy math ways to calculate and decide if a particular value of data is an outlier. But for this year, we're just going to stick with our, our instinct as we look at a data set. We should be able to sort of tell 
if there is an outlier or not. So for this little data set, 56, 65, 73, 59, 98, 65, and 59, which of those values is an outlier? And hopefully you notice that the value 98 is a lot higher than the other values. The next closest one is over 25, um, distance of 25 away from that. So 98 would be the outlier there. Well, what does an outlier mean? Well, in some cases, it might mean that there was an error, but in other cases, it's a really important uh, part of the data. So same data set, we've got that outlier of 98. Uh, if the data represents water temperatures of a lake at seven different locations, what does that outlier mean? What, what happened to give me that outlier? Well, in this case, uh, 98, it could have been a measurement error. Like somebody read the thermometer incorrectly. Maybe it was supposed to be 68. Maybe it could have been a recording error. Like as the guy wrote down the temperature, he literally just accidentally put a 9 instead of a 6. could be a recording error. Uh, it could be a malfunctioning thermometer. Or it could it could actually represent uh, some sort of hot spot on the lake, like a hot spring. Um, So you'd have to just really think about that. And if, you know, if you were originally collecting the data and you got a 98, I would re-measure at that moment and, and double check, but uh, it could represent a lot of different things. What if the data represented the number of customers in a restaurant each night in one week? What does that 98 mean? Is it an important part of the data or not? Well, if it was talking about the number of customers, that 98 probably represents their busiest night. Maybe, rep, re, I can spell rep, represents their busiest night. Maybe it's a Friday or a Saturday. But probably, actually, their most busy, most important day of the week. Uh, sometimes if you know that an outlier is from a measurement error, you may want to disregard it, um, but you should always still list it and maybe give your reasons why. Um, this is kind of an example of, of that. So this data, all these little dots represent the heights of students uh, that were surveyed in America. And the students were asked online to input their height in centimeters, and they collected data from loads of people. So the population was students in America. It was an online survey, so it would be a self-selected or a voluntary sample. Those mean the same thing. So any online survey is typically self-selected. You can choose to fill it in if you want, or you can choose to not. So you can see my height. I'm like a little over 150 centimeters. I'm right here. You all know how tall I am. So this and this seem very problematic to me. Uh, the average length of a baby when it's born is right here. So all these little babies are entering data in. Does that seem right? I don't know. Uh, so thinking about your data is really good. Sometimes data is inaccurate, and there's definitely a reason for these two clusters. Uh, the one on the far left is from students who measured their height in feet instead of centimeters. Uh, probably not this guy right here, but this other cluster near zero. They said they were five feet tall or six feet tall or four feet tall. Uh, possibly could have been from missing one of the digits as they typed, like they thought they hit uh, one of the digits and they didn't. 
that second cluster is sort of more to the middle is likely to be students who measured their height in inches instead of centimeters. Um, so if you were analyzing data here and really wanted to know about heights of students, you probably would want to focus on this data over here um, because this is going to be more representative. These two are most likely just errors and aren't representing the real heights of people. All right, so that's it. Your homework assignment is the 11.2 assignment. If you have questions, uh, let me know. And if you don't have a calculator at home, remember you can always come in at lunch or before school or in after school. Or, and of course, sometimes we also have time in class that you can use those calculators. So make sure, uh, there's also online cal uh, statistical calculators you could use. So let me know if you need any help with this lesson.